Welcome to those of you who've joined us already. I'm Kim Churches, CEO of AEW, and you're joining us for a terrific webinar tonight brought to you by our supporter, Geico, who's uh, helping to bring many of these webinars uh, to our homes as we are all sheltering in place still in the waning months, we hope, of the COVID-19 pandemic. But tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about how this pandemic is uh, challenging women-owned um, businesses and how those entrepreneurs are facing those challenges and we hope continuing to thrive. And we've got a lot of ideas around uh, wh wh what uh, women can do to face those challenges, those barriers, those biases that have been truly exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic. But women-owned businesses have for far too long have had issues with lack of funding, of bias against their ideas, uh, and, and definitely during the pandemic, we've seen Black-owned businesses and women-owned businesses hit the hardest during uh, this downturn of our economy. They've had to cut more jobs than uh, male-owned businesses as well. So tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about what those hits mean um, and how we can get past the she session, which we've heard a lot about in terms of essential workers, those in uh, leisure, hospitality, restaurants, uh, in, in, in restaurant and retail, but we really haven't spent enough time, I don't think, really dealing with what women-owned business owners are, are doing right now during the pandemic and how we can really build back better systems and practices so that women-owned businesses can thrive as we start developing a brand new normal. I am delighted to welcome you tonight to what I know will be a terrific conversation. We are so lucky to have terrific panelists joining us who will share their expertise on this important topic. Um, first up, I wanna introduce Lori Fabiano, who's the president of the Tory Birch Foundation, which empowers women and entrepreneurs in the US. Under her leadership, the foundation started a terrific new national fellows program for women entrepreneurs. And she also launched a global hashtag embrace ambition campaign to shatter the stereotypes that women owned businesses have had for far too long. And they've been providing $60 million in low interest loans to women entrepreneurs in a terrific partnership with Bank of America. She has a long history of advancing philanthropic endeavors. Uh, she was senior vice president of the Robin Hood Foundation in New York for 10 years and helped to grow that organization's grant making from 11 to an astounding $154 million to support poverty fighting organizations. Um, prior to that, she produced AIDS walks and dance-a-thons countrywide and served as deputy mayor of Hoboken, Hoboken excuse me. And most recently, she ran her own marketing and events company, working with clients that include Amazon. So welcome, Lori, and thanks for being with us this evening. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Mabel Abraham, who is an assistant professor of management at Columbia Business School. Her research examines how organizational and social network processes contribute to gender differences in economic outcomes. Spoiler alert, those of you who've been uh, in AUW discussions before, you know that all that we're working on, there are so many huge gaps in, in how we uh, approach gender roles here, setting women back still far too often, and she'll, she'll talk about that. In one recent project, Professor Abraham compares the relative benefits received by male and female entrepreneurs through strategic social networks aimed at get generating new clients. In other work, she's examined evaluation processes and how they affect the attention and recognition investment professionals receive from their professional peers. Her research has appeared in the Academy of Management Journal and Administrative Science Quarterly, and has been recognized by a number of leading awards, including the Academy of Management's Pondy Best Dissertation Paper Award, uh, she received an American Association of University Women American Fellowship. We're delighted that she's an alumni of our fellows program and the Kaufman Foundation Dissertation Fellowship. So we're thankful to, to you, Dr. Abraham, for joining us this evening and welcome to you both. Thank you, Lori and Mabel, for being with us. So I'm going to dig in here a little bit because we know that access to capital is one of the biggest issues facing women-owned business owners today um, and, and yesterday and will be far into the future. And Lori, I'd love to kind of start with you here, just about some of the challenges women entrepreneurs were facing you know, before the pandemic and how those kind of compounded during the pandemic over this, uh, this past year. And maybe you can give us a sense of where you see women going um, as we start crawling out of this morass. 
Well, the problems are the same. They've just been exasperated. And, and I really feel like the pandemic has just laid them bare. And, and that's because a lot of the problems women ever resourceful figured out, in my mind, workable solutions that were band-aids. So women who couldn't get a bank loan bootstrap. They borrowed money from family, friends, et cetera. Um, they went to CDFIs. Um, they, they had childcare, which is the other enormous issue they're facing. They, they you know, had Band-Aid solutions. So the, the pandemic ripped off all the Band-Aids and it really laid bare um, where we're at. And, and I think, you know, even the title of tonight's talk, Two Steps Back, to be honest, I don't think it's two steps back because we, we never really got two steps forward. We, we got where we thought we were with a lot of workarounds, a, a lot of um, temporary solutions. And um, so what we're seeing in capital particularly is, so PPP loans, they, the loans go out. We know that women got far, far less uh, PPP than uh, men did. Why? Because the initial um, uh, PPP loans, the first thing the banks did was call all their big clients. All their big clients are men. You know, it's, it's a perpetual cycle. So women were once, again, left out of it. So, so what does that mean? What does it mean when women don't have that access? Well, over 41% of Black-owned, um, women Black-owned businesses closed compared to 17% of white owned businesses. And, and that's because again, they did not have the same access. Um, women obviously were more likely to lose jobs in this and, and women were far less likely, as we already said, to receive federal relief. And, and that doesn't really even scratch the surface. Um, it is because of the infrastructure of our banking system where women have been on the margins that we're now in this situation where women are far, are, are really worse off uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, that's sobering, sobering information. I remember reading uh, a little bit about how the banks were just reaching out to their clients first and that lack of access to uh, the PPP loans and what that meant. We'll talk a little bit further too about what, what some of those ideas are for policymaking decisions to kind of improve upon that for more equitable access. But Mabel, let's turn to you for a second here, because as we're talking about the context of this within the pandemic, it's actually important to understand the mechanisms of gender equality and how they've been magnified during this time, exactly as Lori just said. Can you talk a little bit about some of those mechanisms and how they manifest in our society as we think about equality and these issues for women entrepreneurs? Yes, of course. Um, so I think at the most basic level, thinking about this issue of women being excluded, um, what we know is that networks and relationships are so important for accessing the kinds of resources that female entrepreneurs need, whether it be capital or business development, they're constantly turning to peers and to contacts to get access to that information and then hopefully to get access to resources. Women are already excluded from so many of these networks, right? We know that women tend to be in networks that are predominantly female, that are disproportionately uh, represented by people in the family as opposed to broader, more diverse networks. They tend to basically lack the connection to the high status individuals that can give them access to those desirable resources. So then we take something like the pandemic that has put everyone in isolation. Um, essentially what it's done is it's exacerbated that difference where it's put women in a position where they're already excluded and the barriers that are there for developing relationships are so magnified. So not only are we all at home, but to Lori's point, women now are the ones who are bearing the brunt of the childcare responsibility. So even when you're trying to develop these connections and make time to broaden the social network in this new environment, you're doing so while you're also caring for homeschooling your child or caring for a young baby and you don't have the capacity um, to invest the kind of resources that men on average are able to do. Um, one thing I've thought a lot about is I know in our household, we have a pretty even division of labor where my husband and I are both equally responsible for the children. But when it comes to work, there are still moments even in this equitable division where his work dominates um, because I'm in a faculty position and have more flexibility. Flexibility kicks in where, of course, yes, you have a call or you have a meeting with 
senior executives in your company. Therefore, I'll do the responsible, the take the responsibility at home. Um, so I think to, to expect that we're moving towards a place where domestic labor is more equitable and that's the solution, it still isn't, right? The, the gender norms are so deeply ingrained that it's not enough. Um, the second mechanism that I'll highlight beyond access to resources through networks uh, relates to uncertainty. So through all of my research, a uh, very sort of dominant and persistent finding is that gender biases tend to be most pronounced or strongest when the person who is making the decision faces a lot of uncertainty. So for example, if we're in a situation where we're selecting a candidate for a job, it's much more likely that men are advantaged when there are lots of candidates because it's hard to sift through all of that information. So again, if you take the COVID-19 situation, um, what it's basically done is heightened uncertainty on every dimension. It's put us in a situation where everything is uncertain from when we're going to come out, you made the reference to we hope we're on the tail end, we sure hope so, but there's uncertainty even about that. So in the situation where there's just so much lack of, such lack of clarity about what the next steps are going to be, everyone is on edge and facing that uncertainty, it just makes it more likely that the typical gender biases that are already there just become magnified. Um, so there's a concern that even when men and women are in the running for different things, whether it be a job, access to funding, um, looking for employees, that they're, they're just going to be disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis men. Yeah, yeah, and we've, we've been talking about this quite a bit as we've been looking at the other losses for women of color uh, and women in the workforce during this time. And, you know, you find where my layer of hope on what we're saying, because a lot of this is a bit depressing as we start this conversation, but I think that that bit of hope for me is that um, our heads are firmly out of the sand now that we we can't, we're looking at things with clear eyes. There's no longer any opacity that we can see what those inequities that have always been there. Um, and we have to demand the changes that we deserve as, as half the population and, and nearly half the, the workforce. I wanna touch on something you said because we haven't talked about caregiving and how it relates to women business owners as well. But for women entrepreneurs, um, in many cases, exactly as you're describing in your household and in, in so many households, even when you have woke progressive uh, partners, kind of those ingrained um, social structures around caregiving come into place. And I read uh, in, in one article a few weeks ago about the double, double shift, that it's like you feel like you're, you're working a double shift at work and a double shift at home in caregiving, uh, both for elders and for young children. And that just can be so overwhelming that, you know, some women, even if they were in thriving businesses are opting out um, and are perhaps closing uh, their businesses as well that they own just because of that undue pressure. And so, you know, as we think about the resources needed, and, and I'm so glad you brought up networks as well because that network if you don't have that strong network and, and it can feel like giving up sometimes um, too I'm sure so let's talk a little bit um, a little bit more here Lori um, you know as, as we are thinking about kind of trying to get that that sunshine on the horizon and thinking about solutions for uh, the future I know you and your colleagues at the Tory Burch Foundation have been thinking about this quite a bit. So in what ways do you feel like, um, we, we know what the government is starting to do and we know there's a lot more that will come at the municipal, state and federal level here to build back our economy. But tell me a little bit about how private funders uh, like the Tory Burch Foundation are responding to empower women with businesses during this time. Um, and how has kind of your own mission and, and your work changed um, since, since the COVID-19 pandemic kind of shut down the world we knew? So just to be clear, um, what we've done as a private foundation and what private companies are doing, um, which has been a lot more than I've seen, certainly in my career, is can never be nearly enough. This is going to have to involve government solutions. It's going to have to involve um, changing the infrastructures for the two greatest impediments for women entrepreneurs. Those impediments are access to capital, as we've said and childcare. I think the biggest eye opener for us this year has been the childcare piece. We always knew that access to capital was a problem. We did not realize that actually childcare is a far greater problem. Um, one of the things that we've just done is as a company and also the foundation is joined the, the council, the business council on care that's being formed via Time's Up right now. Uh, with the goal of really looking at the infrastructure of childcare, 
for businesses modeling good child care practices and advocating for, for more for child care. Um, but so what have we done as a foundation? We pivoted right away. We, we knew that with PPP, women were going to need help um, getting through the whole PPP process. So our website quickly became a resource for women entrepreneurs to get the information they needed about PPP. We also launched a very popular webinar series that started mainly with information about PPP and applying, but then we saw that we really just needed to go into the evergreen topics of you know, marketing and finance, et cetera, as well, because if you know, women had to be their best during this period to survive. And so they were all looking for guidance. Um, one of the interesting things that happened is, is if, we're, if we're looking for silver linings, we had one with our fellows program, which is uh, we didn't want to, the fellows program previously had been based on bringing our fellows all together, doing in-person workshops and we have 50 fellows a year and we get thousands of applications. So these women are really keys to, you know, being future entrepreneurs that are going to raise it up for everybody, not just themselves. And we pivoted with that program and we brought everything online and it is such a better program now. And, and something to Mabel's point that we did is we really built out the community and, and they have such a strong community now amongst each other and with our past fellows that's really buoyed them in addition to we were able to go very deep and find out what their needs were and really help tailor their businesses, not only to get through the pandemic, but to you know, strengthen um, over time. So uh, I'd say the, the pivots for us have been, how do we get through the pandemic, but also getting a clearer picture on what the, the needs were. Yeah, and I think you know that's really interesting. We we have a, an equity network here that we're working with early and mid career um, um, folks in the workforce right now, and it's been amazing. You know, just over this period of time, Mabel uh, touched on the networks, and you know, when you're in a pandemic and we're all stuck, the, the seventy percent of us that are lucky enough and privileged enough to be able to work from home uh, that aren't in essential essential positions, you know, how you tap into your mentors, uh, to your sponsors, to your peer network is really Really difficult in this time. And so having those resources to be able to think through, you know, business sustainability planning, strategic planning, uh, access to capital, all the things. And, and as you said, the basics of marketing 101, you can feel completely alone if you're in the nascent years of building your business and now the world is shut down um, unless you have those types of resources. So thank you for all you're doing, um, Lori, really to you and the foundation. Um, Mabel, I'd love to ask you a little bit more about your research um, and kind of you know, the understanding of how social network and organizational processes really perpetuate gender inequality. How does that apply right now as you're thinking about the future for women entrepreneurs and women-owned businesses post the pandemic? You know, what are your concerns um, and, and where, where, where's your advice as we think about our way out of here? So I'll answer first with a part that's not directly about networks that came off of something Lori said, and then I can speak to some of my research on networks. Uh, one concern I have, and this is not particularly based on my specific research, but one concern I have is that a lot of what we're doing to help women is just targeting women. Um, and that's 100% an important piece of the puzzle, right? We need to give women the resources that they need to get through this difficult time. And almost like that's the, the boots on the ground way of dealing with this is to help the women as they're struggling. But we really need to involve men. Um, and a lot of the work that I've done has been comparing men and women as opposed to thinking about what works for women versus doesn't work for women. Um, the, the, at the end of the day, what we need to get to is a place where we're changing structures. And for better or worse, the structures are still largely developed by men. So getting men into the fold and really helping them understand what these challenges are and how do we sort of create the workplace structures, um, whether it be from a lending perspective, evaluation perspective more generally, to enable them to, to let women thrive, basically, to not be barriers. Uh, so that's a deep concern that I had before COVID. Um, many times, even with researchers, when they're studying gender issues, they're thinking about, like, let's understand the women, but we can't do anything for the women without including the men. And just really sort of putting that out there as an important component. 
Um, the second piece, and related specifically to networks, I'll share a finding that I have um, where I studied female entrepreneurs. In my research, I've, I've very much focused on women, um, small business owners. So these are not, when I say entrepreneurs, I'm not thinking about the high tech, high growth, but the typical entrepreneur. Um, so in that research, what I wanted to get at was how and when do women get the same benefits from their connections um, and under what conditions do they not, right? So the common argument is women are just in bad networks. Um, and my pushback on that is sure, on average, maybe women don't have as strong a networks, but what happens when they do? Does getting into the good network solve the problem? Does it fix it? Um, and what I find is the good news is on some, in some cases it does. So developing a network that is actually diverse and has connections to high status others does give advantages to women. The caveat is not when it involves connecting women to other people. Um, so what do I mean by that? If I have a direct connection to a lender and I have a relationship with that person, what my evidence shows that the bias goes away, right? That person that I'm connected to doesn't treat me as a woman, treats me as an individual, and you don't see gender biases come into play. But if instead, let's say I'll use Lori as an example, if I'm connected to Lori and we have a relationship, but for me to access the resource, I need Lori to make a connection for me to someone else that she knows. That's where we see the biases come back in. So Lori's willing to engage with me. She's not discriminating directly, but what happens is she starts to wonder, do I wanna make a connection for Mabel to my friend, Sam? Or is Sam going to be put off by the fact that she's a woman? Does he have biases? Does he simply expect that this would be a man and is going to be surprised to see it be a woman? Um, so all of those assumptions and um, inferences that we make about other people lead to a, an inequality when those connections involve a third party or an outsider. Uh, and that's a really important finding because the value of networks very often is not about my connection to Lori. Lori is not the end all be all source of resources, but it's that by knowing Lori, I hope to get access to her broader network. Um, so what I find is that there is that inequality there. Um, and an, an additional co important component is that that effect, that sort of disadvantage is most pronounced for female entrepreneurs who are in male type occupations. Right, so if you're a female, uh, if you're a female service provider, right, if you're working in one of the service in the, ser the service industry, a more female type industry, you're not facing that same inequality. But if instead you're a tradesperson, if you're an electrician or a plumber, let's say for the most male type occupation, um, that's where those biases really come into play. So those women are even more disadvantaged. Wow, um, you know, and that's, I, I really am glad you you brought up net, because we think about networking as direct and there's so much of that um, tertiary, you know, mm -hmm. the third party involvement here that's so critical for really building out a robust network and for potentially building out a client base as well for uh, women owned businesses. And it's interesting, you know, in, in this time, this is just anecdotal from me, but I started uh, counting it up. LinkedIn, uh, you know, for those of us in, in professional careers, LinkedIn has become such a tool for us during this time. The amount of humans who have reached out to me to join my um, network on LinkedIn have overwhelmingly been men in this past year, which has been really, and I, and I really realized it about last summer where I started looking at it and counting like, this is sort of odd, you know, given, given my day job and what I'm working in and yet all of these humans are coming at me from, you know, fifth kind of a six degrees of Kevin Bacon. So I started kind of keeping track um, and looking at it. It is really amazing to me. And so some of this is uh, for those of you uh, women out there that are interested, feel free to, to grab me. I want those <laughs> that, that data to start to change on LinkedIn as well. But uh, this is this is really key. Um, Lori, I want to. Oh, go ahead. One quick thing is, is that there's there's differences between networks too. Um, networks to get other work is kind of what we're talking about here, but for women entrepreneurs, a knowledge network is is really really key. So, um, our the networks that our fellows make is really more around knowledge. You have because a lot of women entrepreneurs have pivoted from other jobs. Uh, many of them have never been a business person before. Many of them never even went to business school. So a lot of them are sharing and exchanging knowledge. And for women entrepreneurs, that is really essential. Yeah, that's actually a good distinction because that's um, and what I study very often. It's about this, these resource exchanges where you're trying to access resources. Right. Um, we actually find that women, um, even in mixed gender networks, the penalties are not as large when we're thinking about information sharing. Right, it's really when it comes to making these connections that things really manifest, which is the good news, right? It's easy to really like park and mm -hmm. focus on the negative components, uh, but the fact that 
A, women are getting the same benefits in the direct connections and that we don't see it when it's information sharing quite to the same extent um, is, is the, the bright side of things. Is, is, is yeah. a you know, we had a question in the Q&A too, are we talking about implicit or um, explicit bias here? And I, I, I would gather, uh, Mabel, it's probably both in some cases. It might be the unsaid um, or the explicit bias in some of these ways. Am I right? Or is it largely unconscious bias? So it's really tricky, right? It's, it's, I actually take issue at some level with, with drawing lines between implicit and explicit because it presumes that we know something about intentionality, which we don't know. In some ways, an interpretation of explicit versus implicit is that when it's explicit bias, it's like malicious or has some malintent. And when it's implicit, it's not our fault. Um, so I will per first put that out into the universe just as a uh, my perspective on that distinction. Um, in, in one study, I mean, in my research in general, I guess the evidence is suggestive of it being a more automatic process. Um, so in one study, for example, where I find that um, women are disadvantaged more so when there are lots of candidates to select from, which I alluded to earlier. Um, the fact that we don't see that same female disadvantage when an evaluator is focusing on 10 candidates as they do when they're looking at 100 candidates tells us that it's an automatic sort of heuristic that we use when we're filtering through lots of options. We can't look at them each closely. And we still have these biases and stereotypes that men on average, all else equal, are going to be more committed to their career, better performers, more quantitative, whatever the case might be. So when we're assessing these people, we're thinking, okay, as a first pass, let me narrow down the set and gendered factors into that stage. Um, when I'm looking at 10, I can actually take the time to look at the credentialing and I don't pay attention to it as much. So I definitely have some evidence that these processes can be automatic, um, but as like just lived experience, I also watch people come across playing it off as implicit bias and it's hard to believe that there isn't some intentionality there as well. Uh, so I think we're definitely in a world of both. Yeah, yeah, great points. I want to remind everybody who's joined us this evening uh, that you, if you have questions for our panelists about what we're talking about to, right now on the impact to women-owned businesses and women entrepreneurs and what we can do about it as we start to rebuild our economy, please place your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We did have a comment here from the early part of our conversation about the PPP loans and access or lack of access for people of color, business owners, uh, and women. Uh, uh, that a woman named Kathy has written in and said, I was told by my own bank where I've had my business checking and savings account for 20 plus years that they were only writing PPP loans for people who they had quote, existing loan relationships with. So my accountant and I had to scramble to find another bank quickly in order to get the PPP loan. And I'm, I'm sure, Laura, you heard a lot of this perhaps from- uh, That was the most common, the common excuse. Look, things changed a little bit in the subsequent rounds and CDFIs became much more of a fixture and, and many people came through, but that whole PPP scenario just once again exposed how flawed um, our banking systems are when it comes to women. And, and that's, that's not an easy fix, not at all. Yeah, it's not indeed. Um, it's a long-term fix. And I do know there's a lot of economic development um, uh, groups at the municipality level and metropolitan level that are looking at these issues too to make sure we can improve access. Uh, no question at all. Here's kind of an interesting question here and then I'll, I'll turn back to um, our others and you may have some stories around this too. But I'm curious, um, Janine writes, with work from home, uh, potentially a new norm or at least a blended work from home and work in the office, um, urban businesses uh, could suffer as will their workers, meaning that we're not in urban environments for small businesses or entrepreneurial efforts more. Any thoughts on that from either of you as we think about um, building back? I know here in the District of Columbia, uh, some of our favorite little spots for, for grabbing coffee or a lunch have permanently closed. Um, I know we're seeing that around the nation as well. Um, any thoughts on that for any small businesses and, and uh, smaller business entrepreneurial efforts that maybe rely on the old norms and how they're trying to think about pivoting to the future? I think pivoting to the future is the key. Um, there, yes, there's going to be less needs for that many coffee shops, that many sandwich shops. And and people will have to pivot. It's been very interesting to see um, our fellows and who has pivoted and how they've done that. Um, uh, one of our old fellows, Erica, uh, had a food truck in New Orleans and obviously didn't have the business anymore, but now she's also 
working with the government and helping to feed people. Um, so, you know, but she's also realized what do people, what's, what's the real differential in her business? And one of it is her sauces. So she's now bottling sauces and selling them through e Um, so there, there are ways to pivot. You know, we had one, um, I love the name of this business is shit that I knit and it's, you know, little knitted caps and things. And she realized, well, people aren't going to be buying as much as this. They're not going out as much, but they're knitting at home. So let's make knitting kits. So I think that it's, it's really going to come down to those entrepreneurial people being creative and figuring out what the market needs and, and what they could switch to. Yeah, yeah, that's great. great I was just going to add to what, um, so this is anecdotal partially too, but just watching here, I'm in New York City and just watching here in the city what businesses have done. So some of our favorite restaurants doing like home delivery on a bigger, at a bigger radius than they typically would operate in. Um, frozen meals, so it's similar to the sauces Lori's describing, foods that they can prepare and deliver frozen so that you can have them at home and, and cook them at home. Um, so I think really seeing the sort of creative spin and how companies can pivot and it's not to say to make an essentialist argument that women are more creative, but one way that the adversity that women have faced, one tool I should say that it's equipped them with is an ability to sort of engage in those types of pivots more effectively than men, right? We've had to adapt and come up with those Band-Aid solutions Lori was talking about and find ways to work around the system. Um, so in a lot of ways, my expectation is that women are in a great position to do that more effectively. We've had better training and having to sort of modify our approaches all of the time. Um, so my hope is that even though, sure, there may be less demand for those coffee shops, the coffee shop owner will figure out what's the different model that I can, that I can take on that will allow me to be successful anyway. Yeah, it's a great, great point. Um, those that are able to pivot, iterate, innovate in this time, uh, we hope they may not be able to reach their, their pre-pandemic uh, revenue lines, but are at least diversifying those revenue lines and, and surviving and thriving in some ways. Um, maybe not all, but, but many are. I have a, one here. It's a little tiny local restaurant we love that hasn't been able to do in-person dining at all, but they started a wine club and they write this beautiful newsletter that accompanies it. It makes you feel like you're sitting down with the owner and sharing a glass of wine and talking about it just through his lovely uh, newsletter. So agreed. Um, I want to um, stay with you, Mabel, here for a second, because I, I really want to get to uh, how people of color in owning businesses and as entrepreneurs are facing this time. And when we consider intersectionality, we know there are disparities within the disparities, uh, particularly for Black women, who are one of the most entrepreneurial groups in the United States, soaring rates of increases, um, particularly uh, since the 70s of black women business owners, just amazing, but have the least access to resources and VC or venture capital funding. Can we talk about this and, 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 and Lori, please chime in as well as to you know how we can improve access to resources for women of color as they're either considering um, uh, growing their business or starting a business right now and how intersectionality plays into this. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that a big piece of the puzzle, it's sort of a chicken and the egg problem, um, having more women in these, more women of color in particular, but even not women in, of color, having more racial minorities or women or at the intersection of both in decision-making positions, right? So having people sitting in those seats who can understand those businesses will be a huge plus, it's, but that's where the chicken and the egg comes in. How do we get the women entrepreneurs to be successful enough to sort of defy those barriers to then enter into those decision-making roles. Um, there's quite a bit of research looking at gender specifically that has found that very often the reason why female products, especially products targeted to women, um, are turned away is that if men are in those decision-making roles and they just don't understand the product, right? They can't understand femtech products. They're just not in, the, they don't have the capacity. They don't have the experience with that. Um, so I think very similarly, if we're seeing black owned businesses targeting a black demographic, but they don't have an audience that can evaluate them effectively. That's where they're really facing these barriers. Unfortunately, the solution is getting them into those seats. And that's where we sort of hit a wall. Like how do we help women get to that, to that level, being able to make those decisions? Great point. Lori, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I, I mean, I do, I think it goes beyond that. It, it goes beyond to the, the, look, our banks are heavily regulated because they have to be to for certain kinds of protection, but there is no doubt that credit scores and how we calculate credit scores is archaic and has been racist. 
there, um, we need a better system for creating credit scores. It has really worked against women and worked against people in co of color in a very, very big way. Um, you know, so I think we have to look at some of these regulations on the government level and see what can change. I mean, I'm a firm believer in we are at a place in, in our evolution right now where we have to be offering lower rates and um, better terms for people of color. We just have to. It, it's not going to change otherwise. And and again, I think it's it's it has to happen at that government level. Yeah, yeah. And that can happen, and just to be clear for everybody on here, that can happen at a municipal, state, and federal level. We don't only have to wait for the 117th Congress or the Biden-Harris administration to take action. Um, you are seeing some of this in public-private partnership, too. It is government, but also public-private partnership, where we're seeing some success, and we just have to create that scale at a federal level. Um, you know, this is kind of an interesting question, and, and maybe, um, uh, Lori, you can share some of the resources out there, too, beyond the extraordinarily good work that the foundation is doing. But, and, and I, I know of this, too, there's tons of programs out there for brand new women entrepreneurs, um, but and as they're just starting out, kind of the 101 programs. But what programs are you aware of for women who've been in business many years and need leadership development, need strategy development, need scaling uh, development to take things to the next level? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, and it's a, it's a great point. There are lots of programs for women in ideation, but here's what we found. Women start businesses at the same rate as men, but where the disconnect and the gap happens is they stall. So we did a lot of research before we did our fellows program to try and figure out the time that women entrepreneurs are most vulnerable. And it's usually around anywhere between $300,000 and $700,000 in income. And that's when most of them are going to go out of business or stall. And so that's, that is the segment of the population that we focus on because we know that if we get women past the million dollar mark in, in revenue, they will sustain, they will hire, and they will be amazing for the community. So there are not that many resources. We were one of the first. Goldman Sachs has a great program called 10,000 Women, um, 10,000 Small Businesses that provides education for some of those very same things. So I would encourage that person to look there. I would encourage them to look at our fellows program, but there isn't a lot. And this is where networks come back into it. Um, uh, Bank of America actually has a great program. It's uh, in association with Cornell uh, for a women's entrepreneurship cer certificate. And it's definitely geared toward women who are a little further along. So those two programs, they should definitely check out, but it's an area where we could, we, we need more help. Yeah, that's great, Laurie. Appreciate that very much. Um, I did see a comment here in the Q&A um, from Jody, who owns an accounting and tax firm in Detroit, and she's helping many women of color that own businesses get their PPP loans. She said a lot of the Detroit banks have been helpful, and she's personally done over 100 PPP loans, um, but mostly men, because banks don't seem to care about small business and women as much. And that's a, it's a really important comment, Jody, and, and one that is in keeping with what we're talking through tonight. So, you know, I'd love to, because we're talking a lot about this at the macro level, and I'd love it if either of you, you know, have any stories, Mabel, through your research, uh, Lori, through working with your fellows and others at the foundation, um, any personal stories or examples of women entrepreneurs, or women business owners that are thriving during this time, any that have been able to turn this crisis into opportunity in some ways, because we know adapting um, and pivoting, as we've been talking about, has been key. And, uh, you know, have you seen any of those stories where you're really seeing folks um, start to take off in new ways? Yes, absolutely. And I think the ones that have really taken off where we're, where we're talking about real significant income um, uh, changes is the people who truly, truly embrace digital. Um, so for example, we had uh, one fellow, Sharice, um, who's amazing and has an accessories business. And right before the pandemic, she so proudly opened her first location. And she was so smart because she immediately closed it 
She pivoted everybody into e-com and she has, I mean, you know, gone, her business has, has gone up astronomically. And um, in fact, she was number, you know, 75 on the Inc. 5000 list uh, this year, just, and that's how fast that she grew. Um, it's also, uh, it's also sometimes just really both a combination of vision and a little bit of luck. We had another fellow, Christine, who has a cloud-based uh, coaching platform. Well, perfect. It's an exact coaching platform that people had to only do that virtually this year. So she even managed to secure 13 million in funding this year because it just showed how much um, potential there was because that's she was in the right place. Yeah, that's great. Great examples. Thank you so much. Um, Mabel, let's turn back to you again. And, and I'd love to talk a little bit about the personal freedom side of what owning a business or uh, becoming an entrepreneur means. And obviously it's a lot more than just making money in our business or having a dream for making money. It is about that freedom and what that gives women access to and people of color access to. Um, and and building, building at the end of the day, it's about economic security for families. Um, it's ensuring that economic security. So as we think about this and through your research, pre-pandemic, during it, uh, beyond, as you're looking at men and women in, in, in work. Um, what are the implications for equity and future women entrepreneurs if less women-owned businesses exist on the other side of this pandemic? And I'll start with Mabel and, and certainly, Lori, if you want to come in too, please. I mean, at the most basic level, a key predictor of entrepreneurial activity, but even more broadly, women entering any field is the presence of successful cases of women in those fields, right? So, having that stall or having us actually see a, re a recession of women-owned businesses uh, would basically mean that we're likely to see fewer women in the next wave um, finding that desirable. Because what that basically tells us, especially if we see a decline, is that, well, women can't be successful here. We'll sort of forget about the pandemic at some point and the reflection will be, well, look, we have so few women businesses in this space, in this industry, so I'm not going to venture a hand here. It's unlikely I'll be successful either. <laughs> excuse me, there's tons of research on um, just women, um, women's career aspirations more generally and how we look up to see successful cases of women in our space. So that's, that's the most fundamental concern. We all worry about the specific women that are being impacted today, but thinking about those spillover effects is really problematic. Um, your comment about the flexibility, so that we go into entrepreneurship for the flexibility, that's actually part of why women are struggling so much, right? I described the example in my own household where as a faculty member, um, I'm pre-tenure, I have structure around the classes that I teach, but beyond teaching classes, I can always cancel a meeting with a colleague on a project and just push that to another time. Um, I often think about that being very similar to the entrepreneur who's dealing with, other than having maybe a, a meeting for accessing funding, most of the meetings with a potential client can be pushed. It's a one-on-one -on -one meeting that can be pushed. So I think the fact that women have so much flexibility, women entrepreneurs have so much flexibility actually serves as a disadvantage during this time. Um, it becomes, well, you can take this on, you can help with the childcare because you, you're not as rigid in your schedule as I am, um, a partner, for example. Um, so I think that's actually a huge challenge and poses a challenge for women, for women as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a really great point. So I let's totally talk about our, our, oh, please go ahead, Lori. Well, no, I was going to say, I totally agree about the flexibility. And I think on a more macro, you asked the question, you know, what happens if women don't come back? You know, what happens if these businesses, I don't think we could overstate how devastating that would be. You know, the vice president recently said, uh, the status of women is the status of democracy. And I absolutely agree, but I'd also say the status of women is the status of the economy. And, you know, women are the backbones of communities. And when they make money, that money trickles down in a way, and I'm sure Mabel could speak to this better, that it doesn't with men. And, and there's a whole nother piece of this too, which is women businesses have a tendency to give back. You know, I'd say out of our 50 fellows every year, at least 90% have a very um, robust give back component. So these are businesses that have double and triple bottom lines. Um, so it's a real, it's a real issue if, if we don't get to a place where we're supporting women and especially supporting women of color 
to get the financing and the child care that they need to make their businesses work. Yeah, so, Lori, I was going to just double down on what Lori just said. Um, I think this idea is very well supported by research, this notion that women, like the female stereotype is basically that women are more communal, right? Um, women are more communal, they're more other focused, less self-focused. So the statistics that you're sharing that your female fellows are giving back at a rate of 90% of them making some contribution is consistent with what we see with organizational leaders more broadly. Um, so the fact that we would be missing that in our communities and our environments, um, and that really heightens the, the importance of having black women in business, in positions of business. If these urban black communities are struggling, they're the ones who are helping those communities directly, right? They're the ones who are on the ground, understand the needs, and are likely to be making contributions to have this social focus. Um, so absolutely agree with that. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's been interesting. We've been doing a lot of different sectors, um, uh, different regions, uh, different industries that have been impacted, and, and certainly all of us have been impacted during the pandemic. Um, and, and really, this is elevating, again, issues that we know we've got to, in, in terms of child care access and access to affordable and quality child care, that's a national problem. It's not a women's problem. It's a national problem and one where we are sorely, sorely far behind um, so many other developed nations. Um, I remember Arne Duncan, uh, uh, when, when he was in the Obama administration, saying that everybody says they value education, but nobody votes at the ballot box for education. And it's the same thing as an American value. We say we care about American families. We care about children, um, but we're not ensuring that access um, and we're not um, centering child care uh, and caregiving as major impediments to improving the economic security of families and, and being able to create better flexible schedules and the like for the modern workforce. So we've got a long way to go for women business owners, women entrepreneurs, and frankly, in every single industry and sector. So in our remaining minutes here, I'd love to hear uh, you, uh, you both kind of challenge what government can do, uh, you know, what, what companies and organizations can do, what financial institutions can do, and what we as individuals can do. Because I can say Right now, I hope a lot of the folks um, listening in and putting their questions into the Q&A box here know that we need to be reaching out to our elected officials um, in meaningful ways to work on regulations and work on access to capital in new ways to support women and people of color in starting and continuing their businesses. But any advice, uh, Mabel, I'll start with you, um, of ideas for really changing. And I think I, this is where my um, eternal optimism stays that I, I believe we can't go back to, I don't wanna go anywhere near the old norms because they really worked for uh, men and were set up, the paradigms and systems were set up for men in a different era uh, you know, to work better. So I wanna set up and turn the page on a fresh sheet of paper with new systems, new practices that ensure we all can thrive in our American economy. So what advice do you have for really uh, better systems and practices? What can individuals do, government um, or organizations? I think thinking about organizations and at some level governments as well, it really comes back to childcare for me. Um, I, I was in a unique situation during the pandemic where I have an eight-year-old daughter and we also welcomed a baby. So we had a baby in July. So I felt the homeschooling pull and the child care, the necessary child care for a newborn at the same time during the pandemic. And it really made salient for me just how short we are in terms of child care. So for us, for the pandemic, it was really discomfort with having someone who could be a potential exposure in our home. We are lucky enough to have the financial resources to secure child care when we need to, COVID aside. But what I realized is that the cost of child care is so so it just precludes so many people from accessing the kind of childcare they would want and feel comfortable with to support their children. What organizations tend to offer is things like Bright Horizons and nothing against Bright Horizons and using them as the organization that we use here, uh, backup childcare. And what that basically means is you can have a random childcare provider that's been vetted by Bright Horizons who you don't know and haven't met before come in on an next given day when you need support. For many families, that's actually not useful. I don't feel comfortable leaving my eight month old if my normal childcare falls through with a stranger just because Bright Horizons has checked a box and said that they don't have a criminal record and they've been vetted. So I really think reinventing what secure and um, reassuring childcare would look like to support men and women in the workplace in a way that looks nothing like what it looks today. 
Um, unfortunately, I haven't come up with what that solution is. I think it's resource intensive. I think a big barrier here is it's one thing to subsidize the hourly rate for a Bright Horizons worker. It's a whole other thing to say, you know, we're going to offer some kind of financial support so that you can have X number of hours of care from a stable provider that you've identified. Um, but that for me is the big, I mean, that's the biggest challenge. It was a challenge before and it's a bigger challenge today. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. I'm going to ask you because there's a question in here just to tag on to for one more second, Mabel, from the very beginning of our conversation this evening about networks and, and women's perceived value in networks versus men. Um, there was a comment here, if you can just add on there, something that individuals can do to help to improve knowledge sharing groups among women. Um, and among men, and, and how to ensure, is there, are there are there individual things that we can be doing to help bolster up women in their networks now? Any ideas? Um, so about childcare, so I'm sorry, I just want to make no, sure. No, no, back to networks, sorry, from the beginning of our conversation tonight. Yeah, because I know you, you talked a lot about your research on networks, and we had a couple questions on there of how we can help, and I'm just thinking about those individual things we can do to help build networks for women. Right, yeah, so I think, um, the, the one-liner takeaway that I would give is, given the findings in my research, women should really focus on developing the direct relationships to the people with whom they need access, right? You don't want to rely on your contact to connect you to their contact. And the further away you get, these things compound. Um, it's, it's a disadvantage, right? It means that we have to work harder, but we already know that. That's the case in, in most spaces in our lives. Um, but really figuring out and identifying who are the resource providers when we're in the case of accessing resource and resources in particular, who do I need to develop a relationship with and how do I develop a direct connection with that person where I don't have to rely on other people to do it for me? Um, it's, it's, a, it's an upsetting answer because again, it's more work. We should be able to rely on our networks. Um, the secondary component would be just dismantling these beliefs, encouraging the people to whom we're connected to say, you know, if you have reservations, like here's how I, here's my performance. Here's how I can sort of show you that I'm not going to fall into the category of female that you might be worried about. Um, so that you can help calm some of those concerns that your connections may have where they, they'll overcome that barrier and make that tie for you anyway. Yeah, great advice, Mabel. Thanks so much. Lori, any advice for uh, policymakers, for organizations? So I, I've said some of the policy stuff. I'd say for, for people, for individuals now, I'd start with the fact that sometimes we have short memories as women. And so the older among us, tend to forget how friggin' hard it was when we had school age kids and babies. And so something simple as lending a hand and babysitting to a younger friend or family member is really, really key right now. Uh, I mean, anything that you can do to help with childcare on that one-on-one -on -one is, is really important. The other thing is to, to go out of your way and seek out women businesses for what you buy and what you, if you're a business for the vendors that you use. It sounds, you know, so simplistic, but not many people do it. And when you do do it, we've heard from our volunteer, uh, from our entrepreneurs that, you know, when somebody says, oh, I really just wanted to find a women's business and do this, it really it, it buoys them in a very, very important way. They feel like, you know, there is support for me out there. I might have, you know, gotten all this bad news, but but there is support for me. And the other thing is, is we have talked about policy and how, how that changes. Lots of times that's nebulous. There's something on the table right now that women should be fighting for, and that's the Equal Rights Amendment. It, you know, it just went through um, the Senate. I, I mean, it... it, it come on, it's a hundred frigging years since this bill has been around. I mean, the fact that there's anybody on this planet that would vote against it and that they're going to use um, uh, excuses to vote against it that, you know, are legal and they're going to complicate it. We're one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have equal protection for women in their constitution. That's absurd. We all need to be calling right now on that and then we have to stay informed of what's the next thing that we have to look at and and really care about if that is for example change in banking regulations or, or change in child care the care act is very generous but what happens when when the five billion dollars for child care and that care act is gone have we changed the paradigms um, that are going to make child care affordable 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. Those are band-aids right now for a short period of time, but we've got to be looking at the mid to long term. For those of you on here who, if you haven't been on our website, uh, go to www.aew.org. Uh, you can sign up to become a two-minute activist on some of the issues Lori is talking about right now, including ERA, including the Paycheck Fairness Act, the Family Act, and a lot of really important bills that are starting to make their way through the House and Senate right now that can actually bolster women in every part of our society and very assuredly in the workforce like we've been talking about tonight about women-owned business owners and entrepreneurs in a time of COVID and how we can build back uh, stronger support. I want to thank Mabel Abraham of Columbia Business School for joining us this evening, Lori Fabiano of the Tory Birch Foundation. Both of you have given me a lot to think about this evening, and I'm so, so grateful to you for joining us. I'd also be remiss if I did not thank GEICO for their support of our webinar series and ensuring that we all can be armed with the right information to advocate individually and ensure that we're building a society that we're going to be proud of for ourselves and for our loved ones. Please continue to stay safe, and I hope to see you on a future AEW webinar in the near future. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good night.